Next up is our panel, Unseen Tears panel. And, um, Doug George is already on the, um, at, on the stage, and he is a journalist, writer, and a much survivor. As I said before, Pete Hill introduced me to this documentary, and he's a special projects um, director at Native American Community Services in Erie and Niagara Counties. And Nancy Jemison is here um, moderating this conversation. He serves as the cultural liaison, economic and state historic site for the National Heritage Trust of New York State. And he's also the host of Original People's Podcast, and there's more about all three of them in your program. Thank you. Okay, now I scan a sombrero. Titoyo and Nikyaso, Amundawa, and Nia. So my name is Andrew Jemison. I'm the uh, cultural liaison at Gononigan, as Rachel had uh, mentioned here. And it's um, humbling and, honor, and an honor to be a part of something like this. Um, you know, being of the generation. I, I liked what the, the lady had shared earlier about the G2 and the G3s. Um, you know, I think a lot of us grew up, maybe in my era, I was born in 76, um, not hearing a lot about this, not knowing a lot about the history of the, um, the trauma, the, um, the experiences a lot of kids had. You know, my family is from the Allegheny Territory. Uh, the Tunisasa um, Quaker School was there. I don't know if it was quite as harsh as um, maybe some of the you know, Thomas Indian School um, survivors experienced, but I know that there was a lot of uh, whitewashing that happened there, a lot of cultural loss. Um, and I was one of the ones that, for my family, you know, most of my family on my mother's side were very um, Christian. They went to church. And I fought that, and I went to Longhouse, you know, and that was one of the things that my father instilled in me. He carried me in there when I was a baby. And just to put into context a little bit, the Freedom of Indian, um, you know, Indian Religious Act wasn't enacted until 1978, and I received my baby name in the Cold Spring Longhouse in 1976. So even being named, given my Indian name, Titoyo, which means he just entered, um, was illegal at that time in 1976. So I was actually, you know, practicing illegally. <laughs> being a person. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that's a really humbling and sobering type of thing to kind of think about is that it's that recent of the past and that recent of the history. And, um, you know, oftentimes you hear people, mainstream society, non-native people, why don't you just get over it? Just move on. You know, there's new things. Get over it. You know, and it's like, you get over it. <laughs> get over yourself, <laughs> you know. I mean, there's a lot of things that you've done that you need to reconcile and you need to come to terms with and understand about, you know, the privilege, I guess, that you all have. And I, I hate that word, and, um, and I have a, 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 a grandfather-in-law who one time questioned me and talked about privilege and what privilege was, and he's a boomer, so, you know, there's a lot of boomer hate these days, <laughs> and uh, he exemplifies what people hate about boomers pretty well. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that this is still, um, you know, a conversation piece that's happening. I, I can't say enough about uh, Santee's performance, the mush hole. Um, I can't say enough about the, the courageousness of the survivors who shared um, with Santee to be able to bring that to life. And, um, you know, to be able to tell that story through movement and not even having dialogue and not really having a lot of, like, language into it. Um, the story that it tells is just remarkable and amazing. Um, and then, you know, for Pete to share this with us, and, you know, I, I think I've seen this video before, but I don't remember watching it all the way through. And um, just a little history between Pete and I here. Um, there was a time that Pete used to wear stripes, and he wasn't in jail. Um, he was a referee. So this might be the first time I might not tell Pete to F off. No, as, as I'm walking to the penalty box. <laughs> No, I was never one of those people. But, uh, you know, Pete was a, a brave soul out there, um, referee, native lacrosse games on the territory. 
and uh, I'm sure you've heard, heard a lot of colorful language and uh, <laughs> seen a lot of things. But um, you know, I, I really want to say that uh, again, I, I respect Pete uh, immensely for the work that he's doing um, in the community, um, in and around the Buffalo area, um, providing counseling services and things like that in the work. And um, again, I'm sure you've heard a lot of colorful um, commentary, stories, horrible things. Um, how do you take care of yourself, Pete, in those ways? Um, you know, first surviving lacrosse games, but then um, you know, really surviving. You know the stories, and again, you're probably of the generation of you know having family members experiencing you know the boarding school and things like that. So maybe a little bit about your background and who you are, and then um, maybe we'll kind of go into some of that. Well, and Kiga Heron Clan, and uh, I'm also honored to be here with Doug and Nancy and everybody here and all of you uh, for this. Um, my first thought is that I'd like to hear from Doug. <laughs> because my mother uh, was sent to Thomas Indian School, and my grandmother was sent to Carlisle School, and I didn't know that. Uh, so I'm a descendant of someone who went to boarding schools. Uh, not an actual survivor. And just be before I'm asked, Doug, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, just on the lacrosse portion, um, yeah, it, it was a, a great experience for me. I refereed box lacrosse for 30 years, and that's where, unlike field lacrosse, where they actually had fights, and sometimes those fights would turn into brawls, and sometimes those brawls go into the, into the seats and stuff like that. So being a native referee in a lot of leagues, some of the uh, the worst brawl I've been a part of as a referee was uh, Six Nations and Brantford. <laughs> Two teams from the Six Nations territory, relatives on both sides of the teams, and that was like the worst brawl I've ever been in as a referee. And when I heard the story of, and at the Mush Hole, where they used to put relatives together in one room, wake them up in the middle of the night, put them in the room, and force these relatives to fight each other, until the room was full of blood, bruised knuckles, broken noses, blood flips. That, when that started making sense. Because that fighting in, in, among our people, I believe came directly from those boarding schools and the muscle. And when I told that story about family, kids being put together to fight with somebody, I told that in a training I did a while back. A while back. Somebody put in the audience who is from, his family is from, is from Six Nations, this was only maybe five, six years ago. Said, you know what, that is exactly my family. Because every time my family gets together, whether it's for a wedding, a funeral, a birthday, whatever it is, there's always a fight in their family. And that's, again, where it comes from, is residential boarding schools. So I love the, my experience in across. I'm glad I'm retired, and so many other people are too, <laughs> uh, from across. But before I go further, I'd really like to uh, invite Doug to share what he'd like to share. I don't know if you have any questions for him specifically, but as a survivor of the muscle, I, I prefer to defer to, to Doug, please. All right, let's start off in the beginning. 482738, that was my number. Uh, that was assigned to you once you were processed in at the Mohawk Institute. That was the number that followed you throughout your tenure at this place of punishment, <clears throat> more like a uh, reformatory or a prison than it was an education facility. And in fact, the Mohawk Institute was not designed to enhance our intellect <clears throat> or to stimulate our minds to broaden our understanding of the world. It was a place of, of uh, suppression, confinement, <clears throat> defined by uh, daily acts of brutality and <clears throat> exploitation. But mine was 482738, and that was the <clears throat> uh, number that was uh, stenciled into all of our possessions. In my specific case, they reduced it to 73. <clears throat> so I was number 73. And we do know that the uh, uh, system <clears throat> developed by Canada and subsequently adopted by the United States 
was later uh, transferred overseas. And we could see the beginnings of <clears throat> uh, human confinement, uh, degradation, and uh, uh, <clears throat> Diminishing of culture and suppression of language and, <clears throat> and indigenous values, uh, beginning in South Africa, the Boer War, where the British deliberately designed concentration camps based on <clears throat> native uh, uh, <clears throat> experiences in, in Canada and the United States, and then later Germans, <clears throat> when they decided that they were going to systematically uh, <clears throat> destroy not just Jews, but <clears throat> people considered on the fringes of society, and people who had learning difficulties or physical deformities, uh, <clears throat> people who were engaged in acts of uh, political dissent, that again, when the Germans were challenged about this <clears throat> by the British, they simply cited what they had <clears throat> done to indigenous people in, you know, throughout their territories, so it has uh, universal application we know too that in the current uh, climate in Israel, Palestine, that the same methods used by the Israelis to uh, <clears throat> physically destroy the Palestinians uh, uh, with their <clears throat> tactics aimed at uh, uh, killing uh, children and, and, and women is an extension of what happened here. When I was in Palestine, my wife and I, we asked the Palestinians about the similarities between what happened to us <clears throat> in boarding schools and residential schools and what was going on in, in Palestine. And it was the same thing that the Israelis had taken <clears throat> that lesson from the Americans and <clears throat> proven to be very effective. Dehumanization, of course, was essential to whatever <clears throat> these actions these people undertook. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the deliberate attempt to uh, uh, break your spirit, humiliate you, and, degrade you. Uh, <clears throat> well, daily life at the Mohawk, at the Mohawk Institute, uh, first it began with <clears throat> how we were taken, and uh, <clears throat> that occurred on my home of Pazasne, and uh, uh, virtually every family at one point on, on our territory had been taken to either an American or a Canadian institution. And the way it worked was that there was an arbitrary decision made by people in positions of authority, uh, local priests, Catholic priests, working into conjunction with the Indian agent, <clears throat> uh, a healthcare worker, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police would identify children they considered uh, are at risk, or simply uh, on a whim. Uh, the priest might have uh, uh, had a particular feeling against a particular family and then decided that those children would be removed. Uh, <clears throat> once that decision was made, there wasn't any appeal by the parents. Uh, parents were, <clears throat> humiliated, uh, <clears throat> made to feel a great sense of, of shame uh, within the community because they couldn't take care of their children, allegedly, and those children then had to be removed uh, <clears throat> uh, to one of the residential schools. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, that happened to me. Uh, <clears throat> so in January of 1967, uh, I was taken <clears throat> by train uh, <clears throat> about 600 kilometers away from Akazasi to, to Bradford, uh, <clears throat> isolated in a train station for a number of hours, not until 3 o'clock in the morning, did someone from the institute bother to come and get me and my brother <clears throat> and then take us into that, that uh, building. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, daily life there was defined by uh, physical hunger. Uh, the meals that we were given were deprived of protein and deliberately designed to stunt our growth and to, <clears throat> to frustrate our intellectual development. Uh, <clears throat> uh, all human beings uh, must have uh, certain, uh, <clears throat> a certain diet in order to uh, retain good health and, <clears throat> and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> it was central to our development of our organs, our skeletons, whatever body parts. Uh, <clears throat> but that wasn't the case at the Mohawk Institute. What we were fed was something that you wouldn't even feed. The worst kind of inmate in Canada's worst, the maximum security prisons. Uh, <clears throat> it was heavily on starches and carbohydrates, which fled directly to uh, <clears throat> any number of diseases within the walls of that school, and later frustrated our physical growth and led directly to 
the plague of diabetes and all that is consuming our community, and, and also towards alcoholism itself, the consumption of alcohol. That was all by design. <clears throat> um, we were given a watery gruel that they called porridge, and hence the name of the Mohawk or the mush hole. Uh, <clears throat> Daily breakfast considered of uh, that, that porridge along with burnt white toast and oleomargarine. margarine. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I used to periodically go back to the Mohawk Institute for one reason or another. And before they renovated the kitchen and the uh, dining area, there used to be on, on the ceiling <clears throat> covered with various layers of paint, uh, little uh, squares about the size, a little bit bigger than the size of your thumb. <clears throat> Those were the pads of uh, oleo margarine that we were given to put on our, our burnt toast. And what we would do instead of eating that, that, that stuff, <clears throat> we would uh, uh, put it on our forks and, 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 and <laughs> fake it like this. <laughs> and it would stick on the ceiling. And decades later, those tabs of oleo margarine were still falling on the ceiling. <laughs> <clears throat> Just we went through it. Noon time was again, you know, beans, starches, uh, <clears throat> white toast, the same with your dinner time. Uh, <clears throat> every once in a while they'd have an excess of, of food in those big, huge uh, pots that they cooked our food in. And uh, <clears throat> you know, it was inevitably some kind of beans. That, that was very rare. Uh, fruit was virtually non existent. But the thing that would stimulate you, that would cause you almost so anger, so much anger, almost to the point of insanity, was when you walked past uh, <clears throat> your daily march from the uh, boys' room and you, you uh, put it to platoons. And then <clears throat> in the military style, you had to march to your the dining hall. It was a smell emanating from the, uh, the dining room of the staff. And we had to witness that as we walked by. Another act of deliberate humiliation where their food was laden with all sorts of delicacies. <clears throat> and, and, and we had to see that as we went to whatever <clears throat> was uh, uh, consistent of our diet. Uh, <clears throat> I remember another part. Uh, <clears throat> we were so hungry for protein of any kind that uh, the majority of of students at the Mohawk Institute when I was there were Crees from northern uh, Quebec, of James Bay, <clears throat> and they would take an arduous journey. It would take them three days to get from James Bay. This was before they built the roads into uh, Swanapee and other places by uh, ski planes. And then they would be <clears throat> come to a central gathering area, and then they'd be put on these dilapidated uh, <clears throat> uh, street buses that were donated by the city of Ottawa, a 1940-type seat. Uh, uh, buses, and they would spend another couple of days <clears throat> uh, traveling from, from that gathering point at uh, uh, Valdor and other places to the Mohawk Institute. Uh, well, the Crees <clears throat> knew that there were certain uh, insects that were edible, <laughs> and so we learned early from our Crees uh, friends to supplement our food by uh, finding certain bugs <clears throat> that were you could actually chew and swallow. Uh, butterflies were particularly good. Uh, bees, if you can catch them. <clears throat> uh, grasshoppers had a, had a bitterness to them, but we went down the line. That's what we, that's what we ate uh, of necessity. And <clears throat> one time, there was a train tracks running uh, just outside the grounds of the Mohawk Institute. And every once in a while, animals would get caught uh, underneath the wheels of that train, those trains. And one time we found a particularly a well-fed groundhog. And we, had, we asked the Cree boys who were younger than us if they would take us, take the groundhog to the uh, cook. And <clears throat> they did so. They banged on the door of the uh, kitchen, cook opened the door. And the <clears throat> Crees held up that bloody remnants of groundhog and said, could you please cook this for our dinner? That's how hungry we were. But we were also um, uh, dissidents especially as Mohawks. We were thieves. Uh, whenever they let us off the grounds to <clears throat> go to our weekly uh, Navy League Cadet Training Corps, uh, <clears throat> we would go into the local stores and steal as much as we could, uh, to the point where we were banned from every store in Brantford. Uh, we were fighters. Uh, uh, the Lord helped a non-native kid who came in our path, 
because <clears throat> you know the brutality we experience inside that, those schools, we, we apply to those kids to the point where we cause absolute terror in the city of Brantford. And if we weren't fighting with them, we were fighting with each other to the entertainment of the supervisors who were called house fathers. They took a particularly delight when we would go to battle with each other. And uh, <clears throat> as we said, uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it, it was entertainment. I remember one time my father, one of my good friends, uh, Jesse Lazor from Akasetsi, and I hung him on one of those curved hooks that you put your jackets on when you enter into the uh, dormitory. And I stuck him on there to the point where he couldn't move, and then I started whacking the hell out of him like a punching bag. And the house father came in, watched it, and he was that got the greatest kick out of that. Uh, <clears throat> but that was the daily life at the Institute. And uh, uh, there were kind of three different emotions that swept through us as we woke in the morning at 6 o'clock, the, uh, uh, the alarm, this uh, bell ring, and then we had to, the, uh, to do the uh, maintenance of the, uh, of the building, and everything had to be scrubbed with these tiny little brushes from underneath the sink to the floors themselves, so they had this military-like uh, uh, sterilization machine to it. And then our beds, of course, had to be made in accordance with Canadian military rules. Uh, <clears throat> but you felt hunger was overwhelming throughout the given day. Uh, fear, because uh, uh, most of the violence that occurred within the, uh, the boy's dorm was boy on boy. Most of the sexual abuse occurred as a learned behavior when the older boys used that as a way of controlling the younger ones. Uh, fear, because any sign of affection <clears throat> uh, demonstrated by one of the boys had a really high physical cost. Uh, that if you wanted to as a young boy, six, seven, eight years old, nine years old, you needed to have physical uh, uh, <clears throat> relationship. You needed to be embraced. You needed someone to care for you. But that you had to sell your body. And then the arbitrary, uh, not the, the, the decision by the people in the positions of authority to select boys at will and then to exploit those boys without any fear whatsoever that they would be punished for this behavior. They did it with, with complete impunity and that happened every night. <clears throat> it wasn't an isolated incident. My, my luck was that I was on the top bunk and that <clears throat> should anybody try to assault me that they, I would put up a fight and had two of my brothers with me. And we were able to fend off the worst instances of abuse. But it happened every day. I would be on top of my bunk and then look down and there would be boy on boy uh, <clears throat> relationships taking place. That's, such was the desperation we had for affection. So fear. The third one was abandoned. That we would sit <clears throat> on the window overlooking that long lane with the fruit trees idyllic uh, appearance as you're driving into the Institute and <clears throat> approaching that red stone building, red brick building, and we would sit on that window. And if you look at the building now, it's an octagon window on the dorm where I was. And you would, you would, you would beseech, you would say whatever desperation you could feel uh, in your mind and pray that someone would come to, you, to your rescue, to your relief. To, your, to, your relieve, to relieve you of this, and, and they never did. Um, uh, <clears throat> no one ever came and inquired, no health official, no investigator, no government, federal government administrator uh, ever came to the Mohawk Institute in my, my time there and never asked basic questions about the treatment of children. Uh, <clears throat> in that film, it was mentioned that some of the kids in the most extreme physical health were taken to a hospital, but I never saw a doctor. We never saw a dentist. Whatever health care we had, had to be the point of, of <clears throat> an injury so severe that it was life-threatening before they would take it to, to the hospital in, in, in Brantford. Uh, <clears throat> so, so abandonment. How could our parents leave us to this type of hell? How could our respective native uh, institutions, those people entrusted with the most sacred of duties, which is care of the children, how could they be coerced into abandoning us to, to this system? And that 
those three fears never left us throughout our, our, our once we were uh, uh, left to school and throughout our adult life and still defines us now. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you with absolute certainty that whatever happened to, to me during uh, my time at Newark Institute uh, has, has more profound <coughs> resonance in my mind than virtually any other instance in my life. So it is with the rest of the students. And that's where you approach it, when those of you who really want to know the story, and I'm going to ask you this, do you really want to know? Can you handle this? Can you handle instances of child rape on a nightly basis? <clears throat> do you believe us when you tell these stories? Uh, <clears throat> uh, can you handle the, the, the look of, of, of absolute terror in the child's eyes when they're about to be assaulted? Can you handle those type of stories when they tell you about near starvation at the Mohawk Institute, that some of the kids would sneak off and go to the local dump across from school grounds in order to find food, and that some of the dump workers felt so terrible about what they were seeing, these Mohawk Institute boys uh, scrounging through garbage in order to find food, that they would leave uh, <coughs> some of that food uh, <coughs> for the kids so they could take it back to the school. Uh, can you handle the fact that there are dozens of, if not uh, hundreds of kids buried on the grounds of the Mohawk Institute? And that we need to find those children, we need to find the why, how they died, and <clears throat> we need to repatriate them back to their home community. The uh, Mohawk Institute remains haunted. If you want to have an, uh, <clears throat> one of those experiences, then go there and spend the night and listen to the children as they're screaming up and down those halls. And despite the many ceremonies that have been done to release the children, they simply won't go until we find their physical remains and bring them home. Uh, <clears throat> that's what we deal with. That's what I deal with. Uh, <clears throat> and if you want to really know the stories, then be prepared to handle things that are, are beyond almost beyond uh, <clears throat> our, our sense of who we are as human beings. It's that bad. Uh, we, were, we were slaves. The girls were trained as domestic servants, farmed out to the local people in Brantford without any kind of financial compensation. The boys were trained in animal, basic animal husbandry and agriculture. We had large fields that we had to cultivate and harvest. We never saw the food from the, the, the extensive work. That was given to the uh, supervisor's families or sold on the market, but we never saw it. Uh, <clears throat> and then the corporal punishment. Uh, <clears throat> if you can imagine the, 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 the screams of kids as they're beaten with these three foot straps, no exaggeration. Anything I tell you here is not an exaggeration. It's not an embellishment. That was what happened. Uh, and it was directed at us by a people, a culture, a nation that had such deep hatred for Aboriginal people that they would do this to children. And we were children. We weren't young adults. We were children. Uh, when I got the strap, I was fortunate in some ways in that I was an exemplary student according to their academic standards. They actually skipped the grade for me. <clears throat> First time that had ever been done. But I also got hit. <clears throat> the reason I did is because I got into a fight <clears throat> and then the uh, so-called house father who was this minister, Jamaican guy named Boyce, uh, a black Canadian uh, <clears throat> who always smelled of a certain type of cologne, uh, <clears throat> but he was notorious for his uh, uh, <clears throat> solicitation and seduction of certain boys. And uh, he was smacking the heck out of me with a leather belt on the wrist. Not on the hand, because you got calluses from all the farm work, so on the wrist. And they would beat you until you, 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 you cried for mercy. So I faked it. <laughs> I pretended he was actually making me cry, and then, <clears throat> then they released you. But the acts of brutality were very profane and direct, and that once you were punished, all the students, the male students, had to stand in their platoons. As as, as that child was taken into that one room off the playroom where, where Santee was dancing. And, <clears throat> and uh, that was the place where beatings were inflicted. And it was, you were made to, to 
witness this. And uh, <clears throat> our, our playroom itself was, a, was one defined by violence. And one of the things that Canada and the Truth and, Reconcil and, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I do not like, I never supported because those people who created that entity never once consulted with us, but he never asked us, what do you as Mohawk victims of this, 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 this experience, what does truth mean to you? What is reconciliation? What is justice? No one came to us and asked that. So I reject it without exception the work of that commission. It was an imposition upon us and, and has not led to the alleged uh, supposed hearing uh, healing it was supposed to accomplish um, <clears throat> because it, it hasn't deafened the cries of those kids in my years. It hasn't lessened uh, uh, the things that I saw there and it certainly has achieved justice because with one exception, no one has ever been held responsible for what they did to us. No criminal prosecutions. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, most of the people who did these things escaped completely. Uh, they're dead now, and if we could find them, uh, could find them, we will go there and we will we will desecrate their graves the way they desecrated us. Uh, <clears throat> that's how much hatred we have. If you want to hear this story, be, be prepared to deal with the hatred that we have towards each other, towards ourselves, and towards uh, our respective communities because of this. It's it's the most powerful experience of Aboriginal people. In the, <clears throat> Since our confinement to, to reservations has been boarding school, I'll give you a figure. Well, <clears throat> there were, we were at the point of physical extinction as Iroquois people up until 1920s. That there were uh, <clears throat> less than 6,000 Iroquois people living south of the Great Lakes in the year 1900. We were, we were the vanishing American. There were 225,000 Native people left in the U.S., a similar number in Canada. Of that, uh, in the United States, 60 to 70,000 of those children were placed in these schools. And same with Canada. Virtually every uh, child in the 19, turn of the century up until the 1940s and 50s in Canada was sent to this, these institutions. And, <clears throat> um, and, and so recovery to us well, <clears throat> is proved to be very evasive as we begin to slowly fade away as we begin to age, <clears throat> our stories begin to die with us. Uh, uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, <clears throat> the Pope was here a couple years ago, and he went on an apology tour. Uh, he deliberately avoided the Iroquois, the Six Nations, the Mohawks especially. We were excluded until I began to make a fuss with the Assembly of First Nations, which, <clears throat> which is representative of band councils and in no way represents traditional people. But I made a fuss anyway. He invited me to go see the Pope in Quebec City at the last part of his tour. And <clears throat> I said I'd go meet the Pope um, under certain conditions. I was not interested in verbal apology. What I wanted is a commitment to justice, that the church would accept full and complete legal and moral responsibility for what it did while we were under its tenure. And that's a commitment to provide us with the records involving uh, our, our stay at these schools and, and the willingness to, 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 uh, <clears throat> to help us prosecute the guilty and for the church to admit guilt under law. They were going to do that. They wanted me to go there and have a photo op and stand next to him wearing a custodian. So <clears throat> you know, then the quotes would be Mohawks, except papal apology. We did not. I, so I refused. <clears throat> I could not do this. I would not do this. Uh, <clears throat> but our commitment is there to us the children. And so what we have done is the Six Nations uh, uh, Survival Secretariat has led the way and is defining the means by which we can achieve justice. And that begins by locating the children and the dead. And then Akwesasne, our group, has followed suit. So that's, that's our commitment. Uh, the, hearing, uh, the screaming in our ears cannot be silenced until those children are, are, are brought back home. And the <coughs> spirits that, that uh, go up and down the hallway <coughs> at the Mohawk uh, Institute, uh, <coughs> they cannot be uh, put to rest until we locate those bodies. So what we're doing is we're using 
a number of contemporary methods to locate the missing and then forensic anthropology determine the cause of death. <clears throat> and then and only then can we bring about criminal charges and then to arrange for their, their uh, subsequent uh, re, re, uh, repatriation. <clears throat> so I will say one good thing that came out of this, and that is leadership. Uh, uh, many, a few generations ago, <clears throat> when there were people who were visiting the Hopi. And, uh, now you got, here's the story. Uh, the, uh, Alcatraz <clears throat> used to be a military uh, installation. And it was converted into a prison to house Hopi, uh, Navajo, and Tewa peoples, the men, uh, uh, fam the fathers of families who refused to let their children be taken and placed in the schools. So it was a place of confinement. But out of that, they had these visions, and they said certain leadership would come out of these places of incarceration. And that's true. And much of contemporary, what we define as contemporary Native rights, uh, came from uh, uh, children uh, <clears throat> who grew into adults and then, in deliberate acts of violence, uh, stood up and created what we call the Native uh, Rights Initiative, one of whom was my cousin Richard Oaks. Uh, <clears throat> slam to Alcatraz. He was a product of these type of uh, systems. And, and you can see that <clears throat> throughout contemporary uh, Canadian history. That is something else that has not really been addressed, the role of residential schools and the rise of Native rights movement. We refuse to be broken. You know, in summation, I'll tell you one thing. Is that we at Akwesasne <clears throat> have always had a history of, of engaging in, in in, in a vigorous defense of what we consider our heritage. Unfortunately, during the residential school, we, we retreated from that somewhat. So the band councils imposed upon us by Canada took an active role in, in taking the children, but there was still that fire was there, that ember. And we carried it with us to, to the Mohawk Institute. In 1903, the Mohawk Institute was burnt along with the barns, and the guy that burnt it was a Mohawk, was Jesse Mohawk named Jesse Adibo. Well, a couple generations later, we are assigned to that school, and uh, we carried a reputation of being <clears throat> troublemaking Mohawks. And uh, we were. Oh, man, the things we did in that school. It got so bad to the point where in uh, June of 1968, they were afraid that our misbehavior was affecting the Crees and the other students. And when they put us on the train, the last train to our possession, this week, uh, 1968, they told us, you Mohawks, you call us religious boys, don't come back. And I tell people this, we were the only instance in boarding school history in the United States or Canada where a group, a singular group of, of students from the, from, from the set community were actually formally expelled. Mm -hmm. that was and what we learned from that throughout our adult lives is to engage in acts of defiance as a way of preserving our lives and our community. So that's, that's been our uh, heritage. That's been our life experience. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but it remains you know, the most powerful uh, uh, collective experience of Aboriginal people in, in, in the 20, 20th century. And everyone sitting here, everybody who gets involved in these cultural rejuvenation rejuvenization initiative, uh, uh, whether it's Santee's absolutely remarkable dance, uh, <clears throat> or it's Ganond again itself, anybody who takes part in the rise of contemporary uh, indigenous arts, um, <clears throat> music, or politics, you have the, the students of these schools to thank for that. Because when we were on the verge of physical extermination and extin extinction, there was enough of our fire left for us to stand and say no. And that's, <clears throat> that's our gift to you, to carry on <clears throat> that, that, that struggle. Uh, <clears throat> it's a better one. But uh, you can see now all your, your, your parents, your grandparents who want to talk about it. It's, it's, it's humility. <clears throat> um, but that's where we are. <clears throat> that's who we are. And uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> just you know, whatever form presents itself. Uh, I'm grateful that people are now willing to, to listen to us and to begin to collect these stories in whatever format is possible before we, <coughs> our lives, are finished on this earth. And I really want to, when I was watching 
Santee and her dancers. So a few things that are remarkable. One is that uh, it would be impossible for a boy to dance that close to a girl during Mo at the Mohawk Institute. <laughs> Girls are absolutely forbidden. But as she's dancing, I'm reminded of, of something that is characteristic of, uh, of, uh, of, of an Iroquois type of physics, and that is the molecules that dance above the earth during the thunder. You know, when the thunder comes back, and you have a thunder dance, and you see all these dancers going back and forth like this, and all that energy. That's, that's what I'm reminded about <clears throat> when, when uh, Santee's uh, dancers do what they do. And, uh, <clears throat> in that brick wall. It's just, the images are sometimes a little bit overwhelming, <clears throat> but I, I really hope that uh, she'll continue to do these, do these type of things. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I appreciate you opening your ears to, to what I have to say, and uh, <clears throat> if there's anything I can do to enhance your, your knowledge about, about residential schools, and, and I'll be glad to do it. And just a note, my niece, is now director of the Woodland Cultural Center. And so there are ways to, for us to, to show and recover from this. Uh, <clears throat> but on Parliament Hill a couple years ago, when they asked me to address the nation on this issue, I, this is one thing. Uh, nothing for us without us. Do nothing for us in the assumption that you know what's best for us. We're still here. Listen to us. We have the ideas, and we have a way to finally reach uh, uh, reconciliation, and, and that's what uh, <coughs> dancers have done. They've consulted with us. So <coughs> remember that. I hope. And <coughs> just thank you, and you'll go. So, <laughs> I'm supposed to moderate that. <laughs> um, there's nothing to moderate with that. I mean, I think um, one of the things in, you know, having done a podcast with Santee prior to seeing the show, she said that the, the psychology that kind of went into the, um, the formation of that, that presentation and that artistry was, it was all about truth. You know, and there's this whole movement about the truth and reconciliation. And she just wanted the truth to come out. She said that it's, they're not ready. Um, the survivors, um, indigenous people, First Nations people of Canada, aren't ready for the reconciliation yet. It's still too hollow, it's still too present, it's still too near, and that truth has to come out. And um, that presentation, if you're fortunate enough to see the mush hole, that's, that's the truth, because what she was expressing and sharing there came only through consultation of um, survivors. And there was you know, a significant amount of consultation that happened just in terms of you know, um, private presentations, private um, screenings, I guess you would say, or shows. And um, you know, until they got it right, you know, and I think that that attention to detail um, really comes through you know, in that stage performance. And um, I was sitting next to Doug yesterday when I was seeing it for the first time. And, Doug told me that after the fact that he had, he had already seen it, he'd seen like a solo show where he sat in a room by himself and watched that uh, performance. And, um, you know, I guess for me, and I guess just to kind of share with the, the, the audience here, um, what are some of the emotions, Doug? I mean, I know that one of the things you said, you know, was that I don't know how she does it. You know, I don't know how she handles and wrestles with what she is presenting. What, what, what comes forward for you? when seeing that presentation? Um, <clears throat> violence. The movement of those kids in order to try to escape <clears throat> the clutches of those people who were about to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to bring that physical discipline upon them. You know, the desperation and the despair and the hopelessness that you can't escape it. There's no place you could run. If you go back home, we ran repeatedly from the institute not knowing we have a 600 kilometer walk, walk in front of us following the train tracks, so <clears throat> knowing that should we get caught, <clears throat> that we'd caught, we'd be swept up like her dancers are in this world, you know, just trying to evade, but you couldn't evade. 
uh, it got so bad that uh, uh, <clears throat> one of my good friends, uh, Joey Commando, when he ran away in 1968, after we found out that we had been expelled and we were no longer <coughs> there to protect him, the same age as I was, he ran with his brother and he got struck and killed by a train outside of uh, downtown Toronto on September 3rd at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, 1968. And it's his death that led to the closure of the Mohawk Institute, which had been there since 1830s. But that's what I was feeling. Uh, <clears throat> you're rushing towards, not through an escape, through, but through uh, <clears throat> further acts of brutality. And what's that? You know, so I'm thinking, these kids are doing this, but they're just creating a vortex of energy, and that energy is going to be turned against them. Yeah. So, Again, I know that, um, you know, a little bit more about Doug, I guess. Um, he was just a part of the, uh, the CRNY collective that was here, um, that was hosted by Danone again, the Friends of Danone again. And um, part of Doug's work was to, to bring this story to life, you know, and to do more of this work. And um, Jiva Theater was uh, generous enough to send somebody over to talk to Doug um, in terms of like a playwright. and. I was fortunate enough to sit in the room that day with Doug and to hear some of these stories. And, um, you know, it was, it was interesting because, you know, when, when thinking about this, like how, how do you make a story, how do, you make a, how do you make a play out of something like this, you're coming from a dark place, you know, and how much can people really, you know, as Doug was asking you before, like how much of this do you really want to know, how much of this do you really want to see? And, you know, the challenge that you wrestle with is that there's this continuum from 1830 all the way up until 1968 or, you know, 70 of, you know, a history of sort of brutality and violence and things that kind of come along with that. But you have to kind of have, you know, you're only limited to the number of characters that you can kind of, you know, tell the story through. And so each of these, these characters almost kind of have to embody each of these different phases. And Doug shared some very personal stories and uh, personal experiences, but then also things that he was informed by, you know, knowing other survivors and things like that. Um, you know, in this last story that he just shared about his um, close friend there that was struck and killed by a train, you know, I just remember that story when he just told that again. And, um, you know, I think in what you see with Santee's story, isn't just you know one character you know it's multiple characters it's multiple stories it's multiple lives and now put yourself in the position of understanding that some of those kids went off into foster care afterwards and were never returned back to their communities to their families how did those people wrestle with that being whitewashed losing their culture if you saw the if you saw the mushroom there was a guy that was sitting there trying to sing a song a simple social band song that he couldn't remember the words to he had been so stripped of everything inside of him. There's a symbol that comes out in the play, in the mush hole, of an apple, okay? And Doug, you know, talks about, you know, this, the, the grounds and everything being beautiful and laden with these, these orchards and things like that. But within the indigenous communities and things like that, if you get called an apple by another native person, what they're referring to is you're red on the, red on the outside, but white on the inside. So, there's some symbology for you. I saw a lot of lights just going on. Oh. <laughs> but, um, you know, so this is something that you're, you're wrestling with and grappling with, you know, and these are the symbologies you said are existed within the, within the storyline. And the other one, too, that kind of comes into this and plays into this is the story in the biblical sense of, you know, the forbidden fruit, you know, and that apple being something that's being held, that carrot in front of you, you know, and this hopefulness of, like, sustenance and, revival and you know, different things that could potentially happen, um, the potentiality, but really, as Doug is saying, nobody's ever coming, nobody ever shows up. So the despair, you know, and the fact that there's people that, have, that are living today still in Canada who have been removed, forcibly removed, whitewashed, and they're off in these different spaces and places. You know, always on Santee. <laughs> um, it's just it's remarkable, remarkable to think, and I guess now is the time to bring in our good friend here, uh, Pete, because um, Pete is doing some nice work in terms of uh, providing services to people who um, 
who have, who have been experienced, who have experience with this. Um, the G2s, the G3s, um, who, are, who are now survivors of the survivors, you know, I guess as well, because Doug had mentioned just before that, you know, there was a sexual violence that was happening, boy on boy, and older kids preying on other kids, these learned behaviors that then trickle back into the community, that then trickle back into society, that these people are now broken people that are now, you know, become predators themselves in a different sort of context outside and not knowing how to release that, how to get rid of those things. Um, and it's only now, I mean, probably in the last decade or so, really that mental health and historical traumas and things like that are starting to be really investigated and talked about. And um, I guess, Pete, you know, how do you, you know, work through some of those things and what is it that you can provide? Yeah, this isn't, there isn't an easy question, or it's a, there isn't an easy answer. It's just snap your fingers and, uh, you know, it'll be over and done with. So what, uh, as I just uh, used the phrase historical traumas, and that's what we're, this is really talking about. Because in the doc, a lot of times Native people, either they don't know if a family member has been to a residential boarding school, because right now, in 2024, uh, much of was in, uh, like 40, 50 years ago or so. So this would be our grandparents' generation. I myself would have been sent to the Marshall had my family stayed at Six Nations where my dad is from. So this is very recent. But a lot of times people think if they know anything about a family member who went to boarding school, usually, I, I show and see tears and, and do things like this. And when we ask Native people, have you ever had a chance to talk to your parents, your grandparents, other elders about their history, about their experiences in boarding schools? Most of them never have. Because again, if you think about, if, somebody, if you were abused as a child growing up, when you grew up to be a, a parent or grandparent, you don't want to tell your grandkids what happened to you. So the worst episode I've heard, and I hate to share this with you, but I, I, I feel I need to just to show how deep these go. The worst, I've heard a lot of elders talk about their own personal traumas that they went through. Sally, who talked about the trauma she went through, the one on the yellow blouse. Her interview in the, in the documentary is about two minutes long. Her actual interview is like three and a half hours long. I heard the full the raw footage of her interview. And then I heard an elder, um, as I was at a conference, talk about as a five-year-old little boy being raped by eight grown men in the boarding school he was at. So when Doug was talking about these things happening sexually, and yeah, kids stayed in the boarding schools for a time, extended period of time, they often became perpetrators of that same abuse on kids, either through power. So we see that, and this is what this ha is happening. But in the documentary, you heard like Chief Henry talk about two generations of parents of, of his family going to boarding schools. But if we think back to 1830, when the muscle first started, there was, how many generations of kids were in these residential boarding schools? That's what 140 years of much lasted. So how many generations of that? Depending on how much we count one generation, 20 years, that's seven generations of kids going through these residential boarding schools. All with that same treatment of going through this institution to kill the Indian and save the man. So we're seeing the consequences of these dynamics from these residential boarding schools. But I also want to give a little context to the boarding schools. Elliot talked about in the documentary that his father was already into alcohol. Alcohol was purposely introduced to Native communities as part of the treaty making process that predated the boarding schools. So alcohol was already a problem in many Native communities because they realized in European history they know how powerful alcohol can be. And when they sat down to make treaties in those days, they would do, you know, have alcohol afterwards see the consequences of it and how people change their behavior. And then they thought, well, let's give, give the alcohol before we sit down and make that treaty, get them drunk, and get them more concessions. So alcohol was already a problem. The other thing that was going on nationally, and I suspect in Canada as well, is the whole idea of manifest destiny. In the 18th century and in the 19th century, manifest destiny was a popular theme in American politics that it was a divine right 
of Europeans to come to this land, to take all the native lands away, to get rid of all the native people, and to claim it for themselves. So the idea here is, is that they would promote it to throughout the U.S. and Canada, and to native families, is that you're not going to need your language. You're not going to need your ceremonies. You're not going to need anything that we want, because you're going to be assimilated if you survive into American or Canadian culture and society. So that's where you see a lot of parents thinking that, hey, my kids can go to school, I like school, I like, you know, my kids being educated, not knowing what's going to happen in these schools. So we think about, in fact, the historical drama, go back to year 1452, there's a documentary, The Doctrine of Discovery. That's how far back and go back, trace the idea of the historical drama. So residential boarding schools is a huge factor in our native health and well-being, but there's so many others as well. I've said many times that I consider that every native person could be considered being in recovery. Whether or not they ever touched a free drop of alcohol or any other drug, whether or not they did that. Alcoholism and addiction is a major problem in native communities, and we talked about that as in the documentary, we talked about that as well. When you steal the soul out of a person, your spirit, their identity, and then do all this abuse to them, where are they going to go? So the consequences of the boarding schools, you know, recognizing how many of the kids who went to boarding school never went home. Yeah. If they go, I had heard another friend who stayed in at the uh, Thomas Senior School for 15 years. When he tried to go back home, he lost his language. He didn't know how to communicate with his own, you know, his own parents and his grandparents. So he felt like a stranger in his own homelands. How many of uh, when the, they showed a the picture of the one guy, Thomas E. Thomas, had it on his traditional clothing, very, he looked very, had a dark, dark complexion. Then they showed him with a short haircut. That was also part of that because they told the kids, dark is no is good, dark, dark is no good, dark is bad. You want to assimilate it. And the more they lighted, lighted up the pictures, that's what you want to show. The one picture in the documentary where there's a group of dated people dressed in their traditional clothing, and then the, the women dressed in white. Again, this is bad, this is good. That was sort of the socialization. We had a, a program at Max. I work with Native American Community Services. I'm doing this on my own time. I'm not representing Max at this on today. Uh, but we had a, a, an effort called the Gathering of Good Minds. And in one of, the, one of the conversations we had in one of the gatherings, I have a picture of two Native women, two elders, who said, and I've known them for a long time, the, the poster that they made is not wrong to be Indian, which is an interesting picture. They're not saying that they're proud to be indigenous or native. They're saying it's not wrong. Both of them have gone to residential boarding schools, where they were taught their culture, their history, their traditions, their language, their ceremonies are all satanic. As uh, Sally said, talk about being born of the devil. So it took for these two women to say it's not wrong to be native. That's a sign of growth. But now I see these women a lot, and now they're saying they're proud to be Native because they've learned about their culture. And that's one thing that always struck me. How come Native people, whether Southern and Southern people or other people throughout Turtle Island, we have these rich, beautiful cultures, our Thanksgiving dinners, our Gnondo, our so many sermons. Every time I hear these sermons, it just fills up my heart and my spirit to be proud of who I am, of what my, my parents, my families, my ancestors. Yet at the same time, how come we have these high rates of health Health disparities, high rates of high rates of suicide, diabetes, cancer, domestic violence, incarceration, homelessness, all these other things. It never made sense to me. How come we have these cultures that are so beautiful yet they're so unhealthy? Then we look at the impact of residential boarding schools and all the rest of it. Then we can understand why things things are the way they are. And this is what we're really trying to promote through my work and through our work at, um, at Native American Community Services in Buffalo. We have offices in Rochester, Syracuse, and uh, Buffalo, Niagara Falls, and Lockport as well. But again, I'm not supposed to talk about the work. <laughs> <laughs> and just a side note, this is my last day of vacation. I go back to work on Monday. And so what are we doing on my last day of vacation? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. I'll see you so that's what we're, we're really hoping to do in helping people, for Native people, to help people understand why our families are the way they are. In the documentary, there are a couple people who are at the podium. That was during the White Bison Journey for Forgiveness in 2009. They, they went to Cataraugus, the site of the, of the Thomas Indian School, or Salem. 
And two people were up there saying, I forgave my mother because my mother, I realized she had an institution for her parent. And then we had, people are saying about that. So when we think about you know, the way things are, if we see elders who are kind of cross or mean or just kind of distant, not very kind or loving, we think grandparents are very kind and loving and doting. If they're not like that, well, we don't really have to question what happened to them. We know these things happen in residential boarding schools all throughout. So we see that, we don't have to pry that information out from them, we don't have to force them to tell their stories. We can just continue to love them, to support them. They may not be able to accept that love because of what they've been through. But we can show that love, that kindness, that support, we can help them. And then as we grow, as we get our, our knowledge and awareness of that, how do we create our own healing? That is part of it, is understanding what my parents went through and looking at what they had to go through, and then looking at the generations of kids who went through residential boarding schools. That's what we're really hoping to do. Because we think of the consequences of boarding schools, not only cultural identity, language loss, loss of life, loss of our own reproductive and sexual health, because I've always understood that gay, lesbian, transgender, two-spirit people have always been accepted traditionally in our communities. Yet we see that homophobia and the abuses that came from the residential boarding schools, it also perverted our, sec our sense of sexual well-being for all people and acceptance. Our identity, how many people married out after they left the boarding school, they married a non-native person. I, I cherish all of our parents, whether our parents fell in love with it, but that's a very beautiful thing, and that's why many of us are here. But the idea here is that just that idea of creating more, it's diluting, not diluting. Native people are about the only group where it was the official call of the United States to exterminate us. Whether uh, physically through the genocide or the culture of extermination through these residential boarding schools and everything else. So we said, think about the healing versus the understanding versus recognizing how we're so impacted to this day and then how do we create opportunities for healing, for reconnecting, for listening to our elders and people who've been through the story, these schools to restore our cultural pride, our oneness, and get back to what our teachers really talk about, to be thankful, to be grateful for all people. Because when I think about what my parents, about my grandmother, um, I never talked to my grandmother. I didn't even know she went to Carlisle, but I did have a chance to talk to my mother before she passed away, and I'm so grateful for that. Because when I was a kid, my family moved up from, from Tuscarora, and we moved out all the way to California. Yes. And all the time I was out there, from six until I was like 27, 28, I resented my parents because I felt kidnapped by my own parents because I felt I was taken away by my parents, away from my own people because I never get, got to play the cross as a boy, never got to know my, any of my cousins as growing up, never got to hear about language or ceremony, and I resented that. And I never told them that, of course. But before my mother passed, she, we had that conversation. And what she told me, she was told at the time of Sandy School is that there's a better way of life to leave the reservation, to leave the care territory, because we have a better economic and educational outlook on life. And I, when she told me that, she said, and I told her that what my, my feeling was about being taken away, but she also told me, because when I was out in California, I did good in school, I was kind of like a good student as well in that system as well, so I got some skills. And she told me, if I ever do go back home, I'll be able to take that experience of the skills to help grow own people. So now after 30, almost 32 years of working at my workplace now, we're able to write grants, we're able to do these things to promote the idea of healing, to develop these documentaries on Team Cures. We have a lot more coming up in the next couple of years. We have some new programs that we're starting out. And it's been a whole evolution of how we're looking at the idea of how we conceptualize and operationalize the concept of healing from historical trauma. And how can we do that in our own culture? So this is a great opportunity to, to begin that, to continue that, so, free, so people can tell our stories, a lot more to be told, a lot more stories, stories to be listened to. And I'm so grateful and so honored and humbled to be here with Nancy and Doug and, and everyone. And this is just a tremendous thing. I really appreciate everybody's being here and your time and just uh, a lot more to come. But again, we can think of healing for ourselves, for our, future, our past generations, Every, anytime you say, say a word in Yahweh, or any need a word, but it's also unhealing every child who is beaten in the boarding schools for saying one word. 
So using our own languages, using our own ceremonies, using our own mantra, using our own what's in our culture, what's in our strain. And for our friends and allies, I really like the idea what each other talk about, or, or, um, or, or Jeanette, you talk about, not just developing partnership, but developing relationships. You know, that, you know, so uh, you know, we can go on again, but I just really appreciate that. So all, all everybody here, again, thank you for being here. Looking forward to the rest of the day and that tremendous performance. Uh, I did see the muscle uh, a couple of years ago, just powerful, but we need more of this. We need more of these conversations. And for many people, how many people have been through historical traumas? We can include a lot of people. So. That'll I'll wrap up my comments for, for now, but uh, many of you always. Yeah. <clears throat> so, now I like to both of you gentlemen. Um, you know, this has been amazing, it's been informative. Um, I think I want to give a shameless plug here to the friends of Ganon again, but also even, um, you know, to, to the work that. You know, Peach doing, I know we're not supposed to ixnay engine may max, right? Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the people that are in the room that have the, the means and the ability, or the friends and the people who you may know who have the, the ability, you know, to, to support um, places that are trying to do this work. Um, in particular, why I want to plug the friends is that we recently hosted the uh, Native American uh, Native American Indian Education Act, um, Association, NAIEA, at Ganondigan. And we had an opportunity to sit down with um, some of the folks in uh, NYSED. Um, um, and we got to talk to them about, you know, you don't learn about indigenous people until fourth grade. And up till then, what you learn about is hand turkeys and pilgrims and, you know, making you know, longhouses out of um, straws and, you know, non-biodegradable things. And, um, you know, by fourth grade, you've already been indoctrinated to believe that these people are gone, that they're in a history book. And so my push was to say, we need to start instilling education and the truth again in education with young people at kindergarten, at pre-K, understanding what is real about what happened here and where are these people and who are these people still. And, um, and I think that this story has to come out because education is something that we push and education is something that we really want to champion and things like that. But education has been weaponized against indigenous peoples. And you have to understand that. And so, you know, there's another thing that is happening right now. So as uh, Pete was talking earlier about, you know, elders and grandparents and things like that walking around a little bit with a, a scowl or being a little bit rough on the edges and things like that. If you see me walking around a little pissed off for a full year here, um, in 1924, they had the Indian, um, you know, Assimilation Act, <laughs> essentially. Um, we were made citizens. We were forcibly made citizens. When we had treaties with the governments that, you know, forced us on the reservations and things like that, you know, we still have those sovereign rights and we enact those things and we have the wampum belts um, that, that is our end of the treaty, our end of that agreement, that we are who we are. Nation to nation, we are still these people. Canada Labor Treaty comes up, you know, on November 11th. You guys should all show up there and participate in that and hear what your founding forefather, George Washington, agreed to in terms of how he would, you know, honor and treat the indigenous peoples. And, um, you know, that's a very important uh, treaty to understand. I may be preaching to the choir and some, to some of the people in the room here, but, um, you know, it's certainly something to respect and understand. But, um, you know, more than anything, I just want to thank you all for, for giving us the time to be able to share these stories. Um, please go and share this with your friends and relatives and other people. Um, each one teach one, you know. But again, if you have the means to help support, you know, a place like the Friends of Ganondi Game yeah, that is doing this work, can we, uh, we, have to get, we have to get to the next. We have to get to the next. Okay, sorry. All right. That's okay. Well, and I agree, with, <laughs> I agree with everything you said. I'm just going to share something really quickly. When my, my son, son, who's 21 now, is in the fourth grade, there was a, I actually complained to the Pittsburgh School District because it said when Native Americans relocated. <laughs> that was actually in the textbook. So, so I want to thank, thank this panel, Doug, George, Keith Hill, and Nancy Jemison. There are, 
there are boxes of lunches waiting in the lobby for you. We, we do have a second half to this program that is with playwrights and young playwrights, and I'm so excited about that too. And we are live streaming, so just so you know that there are people listening to uh, what we're saying beyond this room, and so we will continue after lunch. And we're probably going to take a 45 minute, minute lunch as opposed to an hour. Yes, and we have one more comment for Pete. Just one really, really quick thing. Watching this documentary, watching the play can open up issues for all of us. So I really encourage everybody to do your own self-care because we know not, it's not only dated people who've been through these traumas, it's not only dated children who've been through abuse. So please take care of yourself as best as you can so you can continue, continue these conversations with a good mind and good heart and good spirit. So please do that as best you can. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's really important.